My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here at Central United Methodist, and I want to say welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent as we prepare for the coming of our Lord and King on Christmas Day. You can see that many of our folks are traveling this weekend. I've had a lot of folks come up to tell me, we're doing Christmas early because Christmas falls in the middle of the week, so we are a little bit lighter in population this morning. But all that means is that we get to sing that much louder and fill this space with hymns and choruses and praises of thanksgiving to our Lord yeah. and that he would come and be with us. Amen, Adam. A couple of announcements I just want to highlight very briefly. If you take that insert inside your bulletin, I want to say a word of thanks for those of you who provided some poinsettias for our decoration. Feel free to take those with you after the Christmas Eve service. And for Christmas Eve this year, we are doing three worship services. Last year, we were so filled up at the 5 o'clock that we decided we'd better try to put three of them together this year. If you use a shoehorn, you might get 300 people into this room. And at 5 o'clock last year, we had 350 people show up for that one worship service. So, I want to invite you, if at all possible, if it works for your family schedule, to consider joining us at either the 3 o'clock or the 7 o'clock worship instead of the 5. The 3 o'clock worship will be a little different this year in that this group of folks will be leading worship. So if you come to the 11 o'clock because you like the music, then come to the 3 o'clock because the music will be led by this fine group of people up here. We will celebrate Holy Communion as part of that worship service. To close us, there will not be the passing of the candles. So those of you with little kids who think 3-year-old and fire don't mix well, come join us at 3 o'clock. The 5 o'clock and the 7 o'clock, however, will have the traditional candlelight closing, singing Silent Night together, and then going off into the world, bearing that light to others. So 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, or 7 o'clock, and keep your eyes on the weather, because right now it's not looking very good. So I'm going to ask you to help pray with me. Remind God that Pastor DeVern is not preaching on Christmas Eve. <laughs> To hold the snow back. Last year, every time Pastor DeVern was supposed to preach, it snowed that Sunday. We had to cancel multiple Sundays. So the running joke on the staff now is if Pastor DeVern preaches, you can count on precipitation. Is that right, Pastor DeVern? He's sitting back there on the couch. And the <laughs> With that said, I want to invite the Mamu family to come forward and lead us as we light the fourth of the Advent candles. We're going to just step to the side here. As we light the four candles of hope, peace, joy, and love. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ, the very incarnation of love. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus. Our hope and joy. Blow the horn in Zion. Give a shout on my holy mountain. Let all the people of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. Come, let us worship the living Lord. Perfect. Friends, I invite you to stand and greet your neighbor. Let us pass the peace of Jesus Christ.
we, we declare there's absolutely nobody like you, nobody close, and our desire is to worship you. We want to worship you in spirit and truth as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. We thank you and we praise you for who you are and what you've done and what you're going to do in us. You deserve all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We acknowledge your presence in this place and in us as believers in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There will be Christmas carols at the 3 o'clock service. At least half a dozen. Just, just so you know.
and girls to come and join me at the front if you will. Let the day of our 
you, Pastor Andy. Good morning, boys and girls. It's great to see you. You know, there's a ad on TV, and I wonder if you've seen it, where this man sits at a table. He's a grown man, and he sits there with about four boys and girls about your size, and they're advertising a cell phone company. You know what I'm talking about? And what do they say? They say a bunch of stuff. You're right. But anyway, the, the last thing they say is bigger is better. Right? Yeah, bigger is better. <laughs> now, I wonder, is bigger always better? No. <laughs> we got a big kid back here. <laughs> okay, I've got some little pieces here. Can you see? Look at how small. Some of them are just, they're so small you can hardly pick them up with your fingers. A friend of mine was a machinist in Minneapolis, and he made a lot of these real little pieces. And some of these were throwaways, and so he gave me some, and so I've kept them. Now, have any of you ever been to uh, uh, Florida and they where they have the Space Museum and you've gone in and seen the huge rockets that they put astronauts in. Oh, aren't those huge? They're big as several uh, semi-trucks together, you know. Okay. My friend, when he was focusing on making little things, some of those little things were made for those space rockets. Well, now under that, you have a rocket that big and pieces this little, if they miss putting in one or two, it ain't make much difference. <laughs> it might not work right. So even the little pieces are so important along with the big pieces. Do you realize that even as a young person, you are important in helping God. Do you know what I have discovered, boys and girls? That boys and girls have prayers that are heard by God every bit as much as adults. As a matter of fact, I have been in some very difficult times and I just knew that I needed God's help. And I brought all the boys and girls that I could together and asked them to pray with me. And sometimes God just works great when he hears boys and girls pray. You realize that your prayers can make a real difference. You see somebody that needs help, you can pray for that person. You realize that you can walk up to an adult and say, I like you. And that just, that just is such an encouragement. Or you can just walk up to your, some, you don't have to walk up to it, but just, you know, to your mom and dad especially, just say, thank you, thank you. Or I love you, I thank you. There are so many things that God can use you to do. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. But as you'll find out, as I'm trying to say in my sermon, sometimes, we don't even know that we're being used by God. It seems so small, but just believe that God wants to use you in what you're doing. Can I pray for you? Lord, I thank you for these boys and girls. And I thank you that they are here. And I pray that as we are together here today, that they will hear the songs that are sung, the prayers that are said, the scriptures that are read, the sermons preached, and let it shape their lives for Christ. Amen. Well, you have a great Christmas, all right? Thank you. <clears throat> At the first service, Pastor Andy said I couldn't decide which text to preach out of, so I had to read two of them, but, well, that's partially correct. No, <laughs> Our scripture reading today is taken from two passages of the Gospels, and I'm reading the first one from Luke's Gospel, the first chapter. 
When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. And the virgin's name was Mary. And when the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by those words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and you will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give you the throne of David his father. And then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. Then from Matthew's Gospel, also the first chapter. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph but before they lived together she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said Joseph Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son. And he named him Jesus. You have heard the reading of the word of the Lord. It's Christmas time. It's time for joy to the world. It's time for God rest you merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. It's time for oh little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. Except. Where's the joy for that one that's struggling with a painful divorce? Where's the merrymaking and the calm for that person that's lost a job and doesn't know how they're going to buy food and pay rent? And where's the stillness in Bethlehem when in its dark streets people are building bombs and rockets so they can kill people? You know, these present troubling times are very similar to the rest of ancient history that we read about in the opening chapters of Matthew and Luke's Gospels. And into that time of history, when nations use their ingenuity and their power to destroy and to kill, into that time of history, God performed the miracle of the Incarnation. God came so he could breathe our air and he could talk our talk and dream our dreams and feel our pain and save us from our sins. But how did God pull off something so mysterious? How did God pull off something that great using a nation that had no power, a woman that had no reputation, a man that had no money? Well, the secret to the how by which God performed this miracle is described in one word. One word that refers to the opening of the door of opportunity that was unusual even for God. One word that refers to the door of opportunity that is present for us in our world today. Would you like to know what that one word is? Keep listening. The angel Gabriel came to Mary to tell her of God's plans for her, and she was perplexed and afraid, and I think she was more afraid of the risk that God had planned for her than she was even afraid standing there in the presence of Gabriel. For Mary to concede to the divine plan that Gabriel had explained meant that she would place herself at great social and spiritual risk, for God was asking Mary to accept a pregnancy. But Mary wasn't married. And Mary knew of only one way for a woman to become pregnant. And pregnancy outside of marriage was socially and religiously suicidal for a woman. 
Add to these risks for Mary was her engagement to be married, and a woman could not break an engagement. And so the social and the religious risks for Mary were so great that unless God would provide some unusual covering of her innocence, her future means of survival could have meant the possibilities of prostitution. What about Mary's dreams? And what about her plans? And still Mary's response was, here I am, servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. What is that word that describes the mysterious process by which God was able to gain Mary's consent and cooperation in spite of the risk of the endeavor? Consider Joseph. Joseph and Mary had a covenant of marriage. That is, the marriage had not yet taken place, but they covenanted together that they would remain virgins until the marriage had taken place, and that covenant of marriage was as binding as marriage itself. And again, the woman could not break the covenant. The man had to have good reason to break the covenant. Now, Joseph knew how a woman became pregnant. And when enough time had elapsed for there to be a swelling in Mary's midsection as the baby began to form, and Joseph knew that he was not responsible for it, what was he supposed to do? From a human standpoint, Mary had changed him. And how was he, a man, Supposed to live among his male associates, having been shamed by that. Joseph, being a man, had the power because he was a man, and he had the power of the law. He could have destroyed Mary. But Joseph loved Mary. And more powerful than his love for Mary was the power of that one word. That one word that describes grace in human action. That one word that describes how God's spirit can change ordinary human behavior into godless, godly, and God-fearing behavior. Rick Warren, the senior pastor of Saddleback Community Church in Orange County, California, one of the largest and fastest growing churches in America today, demonstrates the strength of the word that I'm holding out for us today. In an interview that he had on CNN with Pierce Morgan about his opposition to same-sex marriage, and Warren said, I fear the disappointment of God more than I feel your disapproval or society's disapproval. What is that word? What is the word? Matthew so clearly presents it to us. Listen. Joseph being a righteous man. A righteous man. God has placed moral and spiritual laws within the universe, and those moral and spiritual laws are as fixed as the physical laws are fixed that are in our universe. You and I can resist the law of gravity, but we cannot change it. We either accept it and learn to cooperate with it, or it can be harmed by it and even destroyed by it. And you and I either choose to cooperate with God's moral and spiritual laws and be blessed by them, or else be destroyed by them. The lady Stanley Jones put it this way, Obey the laws of God and the universe cooperates with you. The most basic revelation of God's moral and spiritual laws have been given to us in the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, the two great commandments of the New Testament. And Mary and Joseph were well acquainted with the laws of God, and they chose to live by them. And that choice was an expression of their faith in God and their respect for God. And that is why in the scriptures they are labeled as righteous. When the angel of the Lord told Mary that God's plan was for her to become pregnant with God's son, Mary's response was, I can't do this. She would be breaking the law of God. She was engaged to Joseph, and Joseph and she were married, were not married 
and she would not break that law and become sexually active before she was married. And when Joseph realized that Mary's pregnancy was for real, and that according to the law, she had broken the covenant, he knew that the law of righteousness called for accountability. Now I realize this will not fit into our contemporary definitions of love, because we define love today according to our wants and our wishes. But God's definition of love has boundaries. And those boundaries include justice and fairness. You see, righteousness brings all things under the canopy of God's laws. Our view of marriage, our view of sexuality, our respect for truth, our business practices, our respect for right, to the rights of others, it all comes under the canopy of God's laws. And Joseph was a righteous man and he loved Mary. But Joseph's love for Mary became submissive to God's laws. Again, we have difficulty grasping this in our current moral culture because we are more accustomed to making God's laws submissive to our wants and wishes. And then we ask, but where is God? Where is God when our world needs him so badly? And that question is not a mystery. That was answered centuries and centuries ago in the 34th Psalm where the psalm writer said, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry, but the face of the Lord is against the evildoers. But when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from their troubles. See, Mary had broken Joseph's heart. But more important to Joseph, she had broken God's law. And righteousness calls for accountability. And Joseph had to make a choice. She had shamed him, and he as a man had the power not only to shame her, but to destroy her. But he was expected to give her a legal divorce. But, but Joseph had allowed the Spirit of God to shape the law of God in Joseph's heart. And when the Spirit of God shaped the law of God in Joseph's heart, it was flavored with mercy and love. And when Joseph came to give Mary a legal divorce, he could have done it in the public square where everybody would have seen it and she could have been destroyed, but instead, using again the law, he intended to do it in front of only two witnesses so it was quiet and she could escape and possibly find a way to save her life in some other community. You see, God's law mixes justice with mercy. When I was here as pastor in the 80s on Labor Day weekend, our daughter came down from Bismarck where she was a student at Bismarck State College. As she left that weekend to return to Bismarck, she had just left one we discovered that she had left her billfold. And everything was in her bill for her money, her credit cards, her uh, identifications, everything. We didn't have cell phones. But she just left, I thought, maybe I could catch her. But which way did she go? Did she take 12? Did she take 15? I thought she probably took 15. And so I got in a Ford Mustang and I headed out after her. And I just came over the crest of that hill that you dropped down to Whetstone Creek. And guess who I met coming up the hill? He was not an answer to prayer. <laughs> when that highway patrolman came over that hill, I don't know if he had radar. He didn't need radar to know I was breaking the speed limit. <laughs> when he came over the hill with his lights flashing, I was parked by the side of the road, standing by the car. <laughs> I explained to him what happened. A, 
He knew he had me dead right. I knew the same thing. He said, what kind of vehicle was she driving? And I told him, he said, I just came from Wilmot. I did not meet a vehicle like that. He said, she must have taken 12, by the way, which she did. I said, I guess so. He said, I'm sorry you had that misfortune. Take it easy. That sounds like a Tony, doesn't it? <laughs> I thought I'd just drop that seed maybe for future records. <laughs> <laughs> People, he had me dead to right. He makes justice with grace, though. That's what Joseph did. And then the angel came, explained Mary's condition, told him what to do, and because he was righteous, he did what God said. Now, people here, how was God able to do so much with Mary and Joseph? How could God find such an ideal couple at that most unlikely place among the nations of the world, in that one small and insignificant community, at that very specific time in history? And both of them were so willing to submit to the plan of God and throw their plans to the wind. How did it happen? I believe it was all part of a finely orchestrated plan that was carried carefully carried out by God over generations of careful implementation, and I call this God's careful refinement of spiritual genes. Did you know that Mary and, uh, Matthew and Luke both began the Christmas story telling about Matthew, or Joseph and Mary's tree line? And God worked through that. But it wasn't because God just wanted to keep it all on the family. It was because these people were, had been designed by God to be preparers for God's plan and purpose. And each one of them had an awareness that they were specifically to be doing something for God. And many of them were very conscientious about it. And here's what I think was happening. Is that for centuries even, God's plan was he would take this person and then with the work of the Spirit, he would take those spiritual genes in their lives and he would refine them and make them just even more keen than they were. And they passed that gene on to the next offspring. And then God would refine that one and work with it some more. And they'd pass it on. And then here God is working that. And then what happened in the Christmas story is right at that precise time. There's Mary. There's Joseph. God has got them over generations of work. They are ready. And God says, now come. And they were willing to say yes. Do you have a passion for what God should be doing in our world today? Do you have a passion to make a contribution for what you believe is right and best for our world today? And yet, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you want to see God work and use you, it seems like there's not that measurable amount of change that you can bring about? Could it be that God is using though you though to refine and shape that spiritual cell in somebody? You know there was a day when God reached down and farming community in North Carolina and he called a young man and he said, I want you for this. His name was Billy Graham. That man became a prophet to the world. And he was faithful to his call and he lived blamelessly before his critics. I don't think God just said, oh, I think I'll do something big. I'll, I'll, I'll choose that guy. I think only God knows how he was refining those spiritual genes until they were all put together just right in that one man at that right time. Last Wednesday night, this place was just full of little kids. We saw all of those teachers bringing all these little kids in. At least one teacher was even carrying a little kid. And they're up there and they're just full of wiggles and everything, you know. And 
I think sometimes even these teachers that love these kids so much like to say, I wonder what the good I'm doing <laughs> besides keeping them active. Only God knows how much that teacher might play a part in the spiritual shaping and refinement of those spiritual genes that might be passed on to the next one where they have worked some people that say, you've got a passion for doing God's work. Don't question but what you're being used of God. Just keep on being faithful. Because someday there might be another person like a Mary and a Joseph that you and I were used of God to help to shape and prepare so at God's time God could say, okay, come on, it's ready. And you and I help to prepare. Lord, Help us to trust you enough to be faithful in our calling that you can use us as you choose. Amen. Let us worship by bringing our tithes and our offerings.
Begin this week. May the Spirit of God cover you and your family. That where there is travel, you will be protected and kept safe. Where you come together as family, you will be bonded together in a special love. And through it all, may you experience the real meaning that Jesus Christ has brought into our world because he has brought salvation and hope and peace that he wants us to have. Amen.